Hey everybody and welcome to a mind-blowing wild ride with Steve-O. I say mind-blowing because I'm telling you this is my new all-time favorite wild ride with Steve-O episode. I mean it blew my mind. I love this guy. I love what we talk about and man I'm so excited for you to digest me and Kevin Smith and what we talked about. I'm also very excited about the fact that this is brought to you by Geology, the number one in men's skin care with over 5,000 five-star reviews and a great deal for the Wild Ride listeners. If you go to geology.com, that is G-E-O-L-O-G-I-E, Dot com and use the promo code Stevo, then you're going to get up to 70% off of your 30 day trial. Now, their eye cream is so epic, I put it on just one side, I can just feel that side just becoming tighter and not wrinkly. Man, I love their products, and so will you. So, let's get you on over to Geology. Dot com. Use the promo code Stevo for this epic deal. And man, just take care of that skin, dude. You, you really don't want to look terrible in your later years. So, one more time geology.com, promo code Stevo, and let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Smith. Yeah, dude. In the van, in the creepy pedo van. I was uh, walking back from uh, Runyon Canyon. I try to exercise daily, try. But um, as I was coming up the hill, I saw this monstrosity, which st sticks out like a sore thumb in the neighborhood. And I was like, oh my God, they've come for the children. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's out there offering lollipops and shit like that. And then it occurred to me that uh, they were like, you're going to to Steve-O's podcast and he comes to you. Yeah. And I was like, that sounds hot. And they were like, he don't come on you. He comes to you. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'll do that too. Um, this is genius. As a guy who's been podcasting since 2007, never occurred to me to take it mobile, to like soup up a fucking vehicle. This is brilliant. We were just talking about before the show. Yeah. This is the easiest way to ask a motherfucker to be on your podcast. Yeah. Because you, if they're like, oh, I got some shit, be like, I'll show up at your fucking door. You don't have to, you literally roll out in pajamas if you like. Right. It's brilliant, mm -hmm. man. That's well, smart. Well, thank you, man. Now, um, you've uh, been podcasting since 2007. For how long have you been with our homeboy, DK? Uh, Deeker? I mean, I well, Deeker does what Deeker does and, now. and, and, and to, to not alienate anybody, yeah. DK is our podcast guru. We are not with the podcast network. We just have this guy, DK, and he arranges the business of the, the advertising sponsors, does a great job. And I love him because I only uh, promote products that, that, that I'm like. down with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and so I think that with, with the podcast networks, you get kind of told what you're going to promote a lot of the time. Is that and, right? I mean, I think so. I've been around since before podcast networks. Like, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I, 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 well, when we had two podcasts, I, was, I said, we have a podcast network. But now it's a legit business. Oh, dude, it's insane what a business it is. Yeah. But, so, sorry, um, so, so, so you Deeker, I've known for a while. Deeker, uh, I'm not taking credit for Deeker. Deeker is a very smart guy and a hustler and always has been. However, he cut his teeth on our podcast. I was talking to DK on the way up here and he said, if it weren't for Kevin, I would mm. not have a career in podcasting. Well, yes He was like, I was no. very unemployable at the time <laughs> and he took a chance on me. Yes and no. I, w I would say Deeker's smart enough to have always wound up where he is. Um, that being said, yeah, he was the dude who, you know, was like, we were like, see if you can get us some advertising. And he started piecing it together and kind of did that for years and then like built a model that he could then like take out into the world and stuff. They started working with successful people and shit. <laughs> uh, but he's absolutely wonderful. One of the smartest uh, people I know. Probably not supposed to tell us out of tw tell tales out of school about him. But the one of the only sex addicts I've ever known in my life. Wow. <laughs> like legit sex addict where he had to put it aside and not fuck for a long time because he was like. He he fucked a lot. It fascinated me when he told me that. I was like, what do you mean, a sex addict? <laughs> yeah. And he was like, I used to fuck nine, ten times a day. Wow. Well, now now you've met 
two more sex addicts because uh, did you go we, in? We like yeah. Yeah, to a program. I, I, I did. I did an intensive outpatient sex addict rehab. Are you shitting me? I swear to God. <laughs> what is the difference between I like sex and I need help? I mean, it's... Like a compulsive, a compulsive sex that causes shame. It, is that right? Would be the definition. See, that I've never... I've never... Uh, it's never been a shame when I've had sex. It's been a fucking celebration. So I've never <laughs> felt that. But uh, my friend Malcolm um, is a bear in Toronto. And he like, just... He, he was like, at one point, he was like, you got, the day he told me he was gay, he's like, you gotta fucking go bear. If you went bear, you'd get so fucked, man. He's like, they ain't got no, no hot directors except Peter Jackson, and he lost the weight and shit. So Malcolm has always been selling me on it and whatnot, but Malcolm told <laughs> he's me, selling you on being always a bear. trying, he's like, if you ever leave your wife, man, you could make her like a fucking bear bandit. But he has one of those apps, a Growler, Grinder. Right, yeah. right, right, right. One of the, I've got the Grinder app. <laughs> he is he lived on that app and was like having sex four or five times a day and right. he said he felt that yeah that I'm, shame it was a foreign notion to me where i'm like how could you like you should feel fortunate blessed but he was just like you just get to a place where it is absolutely meaningless it's like brushing it's like your drinking teeth. coors light all day you yes. just it's, it doesn't do well, anything I, who going... knew that that was fucking possible except right. you fucking do <laughs> right that's what your podcast should be about I that's fucking endlessly fascinating. Cock what does that mean explain okay F first off i'm gonna uh, <laughs> revise scott's definition of of addiction okay. addiction in general as it applies to any form of addiction is continued behavior despite consequences when something is fucking up your life, right. but you keep doing it anyway, and you can't stop doing it because you have this disease of addiction. Um, so to where I met Scott, his brother and I, his brother's also a, a double winner as we speak. <laughs> we should just start naming everybody. <laughs> people listen and they're like, boy, I wish I knew any of these people. Right, a, a double winner meaning um, we, someone who's made it into um, two different 12-step fellowships. Is that right? For addiction. Double black belt. <laughs> right. And um, so that was, how I, I met Scott through his brother. When I came out of my uh, sex addict rehab, I had a, a bunch of tour dates on my schedule. And I was like, dude, I'm a dead duck, you know? Especially because after Bro, every show. So wait, you're saying he was your sober living my, my, companion? My, my, what, what'd you call it, cock blocker? Cock blocker. Yeah. My, my, it was my, you know who my, Deke, that's how I met Deeker. Okay. Deeker was Jay's SLP, ah, there you his go. sober living pal, when he was in rehab, and they let him out for like you could go to Comic Con for right. two days, but you got to take a right. sober living companion with SLCs. I think they're called. We always called him sober living pal. So Deeker was Jay's sober living pal forever, and then that's how we we met in the beginning. So you were that mm -hmm. for sex? Yeah. Yep. So when you're the sober living pal for sex, are you like? Don't fuck her. I'll jerk you off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the bullet. Yeah. Yeah, we would I'm share, a good friend. Yeah. We would share like a hotel room. So like there's no going back to the, you know, bringing chicks back or whatever. So, and yeah. what does one feel like, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I like food, but not to the place where, well, I guess I have like liked food to the place where it was complicated because I had sure. a fucking heart attack and almost died. So I guess I too am an addict. But um, I, I've never... I, the way I understand it, because I've known Jason forever, he's addict. Addict takes one addiction away, has to substitute it with another behavior. So if you take away sex, what do you substitute it with? Food. Is that I right? Mean, like, so they, you tend to gain weight when you go to like sex rehab? I just lost 30 pounds. After a sex yeah. rehab? Well, and you're like, like, you know how I lost it? it? it, it Fucking. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. A little, yeah, it, it, it can become a little bit of a... A whack-a-mole. A whack-a-mole, whack where you, you address one thing and another issue pops up. Oof. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't know that it's as simple as saying uh, you re just replace a behavior. I mean, like, the, the whole concept of 12-step is... Uh, you know, sort of adopting a spiritual approach to life and, and uh, service to others and, you know, helping people. And Now, that, can I ask this question? Of course. When you were using or whatever yeah. you were addicted to, did you not feel those ways in general? Like, I think that, I know it means you're selfish because sure. you're like, I want to right. do things. But even I know high fucking people. They're always trying to help others out and shit right. like that. They're always thinking of their fellow man after they're fixed up. I think I was generally... Uh, 
pretty good guy. You know, I wasn't, mm. you know, I like the, towards the end of my run with drugs and alcohol, I developed uh, an ability to be quite mean spirited. Um, you know, I, I, I became kind of a nasty person, but being addicted does not necessarily mean you're a horrible person. Right. It's just that the nature of addiction just makes you, you know, like you, you, when your only priority is to to keep getting your fix, it's it's a selfish dynamic and, and uh, it's a, a spiritual approach that... Let me ask you this, that, because we are uh, uh, cut from a similar cloth. You are yourself for a living. Yeah. Correct? Okay. You wouldn't argue that. Right. I started as a filmmaker, but I slowly became myself for a living. Now, I can't speak for you, but I, m my favorite thing in the world to do, possibly even more than fuck, is be myself for a living. Because okay. it's just a mind fuck, where it's sure. just like, I'm, I'm, I wake up and I'm on the job? Like, that, hmm. that's fucking fantastic. Could that ever be an addiction? Absolutely. Is that right? Yeah, I mean... Uh, You're supposed to say no. What you the mean, fuck? You mean fame? <laughs> Or well, not so much fame, but like, I like I, I use uh, um, my professional life to escape all manner of shit. A lot of people online, you know, over the course of the president's Trump presidency, were like fucking ah and shit like that. I I'm not that person. If something pisses me off, I'm like I'm just gonna go right, mm. rather because there's some shit you cannot do anything about. Right. And in that way, it's like, well, I can't shape this world. I'm gonna go shape my world. I could definitely do that, as have you. Look at this. We're in a fucking right. van <laughs> recording podcast. So you have sure. shaped your world. Is there a place where that's possibly too much? Could that ever be an addiction? I I think so. Um but I think that Like you gotta eat. Right. You gotta make a living. Right. In in, in the past like b before uh, I got clean and sober with drugs and alcohol, mm. I had no ability to to like turn it off. I was just ah, crazy all the time. I was just 100%, you know, this wild guy. And I really identified as the persona of Steve-O. Right. And I was just crazy all the time. And I think that what's dangerous, whether it's an addiction or not, we can leave that aside. But what's dangerous mm -hmm. is the idea of being identified with uh with this persona and and having your self-worth uh derived from mm. your value as a commodity mm. in the entertainment industry that because would be that would be mine right you might have just nailed that on the head Doc. it's a dangerous it's a dangerous it's dynamic because when you're commodifying yourself and then right. You're, you're right you're you are only as good to yourself or as valuable right. you feel as you are to the world right. so if you're not a part of the conversation right you're, you're on a slippery slope. Yeah, it's when, true. When, Good when, point. When, when you derive your self-esteem from being in the spotlight, mm. then uh, I think that one way or another, the spotlight will, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll shine elsewhere. Yeah. And, and even if it's on you, that's potentially scarier because because what about, you know, like our bodies deteriorate. We don't be, you know, that's the scariest thing for me because I'm at my core just an attention whore. From the, from, <laughs> from out, of, out of the womb, right. an attention whore. Right. Look at me, look at me. Were you a class clown? Sure, big time. Right. And not even good at it, you know. I like, still, all of my just, behavior just alienated my peers. But, but, but uh, <laughs> they noticed you. I mean, they, they did. <laughs> and and it, it occurs to me that that in our society, like I I would bet that if you surveyed hundred people, that was that the uh, there are a lot of people would not know what the definition of the word hospice is. Hmm. And I say that I think that's important because. Everybody knows what a hospital is because you go to the hospital to get better. Right. But the idea of a hospice being somewhere where you go and you don't get better, you go and die. People don't want to think about that, no. you know. And people don't even want to deal with elderly people. Yeah. It's like being old in itself is a party foul. Yeah. And they, you want, they just want to stuff you away in, in a nursing home. They yes. don't even want to look at you because you serve as a reminder of everyone's Their mortality. Their demise. Yeah. 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 And so. But yet our job is to distract from that of course that's of like course. our main function in life is to be like blah and for a few seconds well, our motherfucker, our job yeah. for a few seconds motherfucker is looking at us going sure. uh, has forgotten right the ultimate truth 
<laughs> Which is like, I'm bound for hospice one day. Dude, 100 percent dude, this is shaping up to be a fascinating conversation because I couldn't <laughs> agree with you more. I, I, re- I really couldn't. Now, being an attention whore and recognizing that, that elderly people are walking party fouls that nobody wants to pay attention to right. it's like now oh you're like wait a second yeah there's an expiration date on this shit right that's so that's so scary a walking party foul well here, that's what old people are <laughs> isn't it isn't it isn't it evolution though you know you began life as um an attention whore yep and undoubtedly got a lot of attention yeah so when one seeks and one finds and gets that ameliorates what drove one in the first place you got to grow so i don't i i think you could be older i don't think you'll ever be old right. like what the traditional but i think you'd be older and still hold the cool edge i submit to you george carlin Man was fucking cool until the moment he was gone. He's still cool now. He's been dead like fucking ten years. Um, well, I, 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 and I he was old. It. Yeah. I submit another one. Stan Lee, old as fuck. He was old from the moment I knew him. When they brought him to Mallrats, they told us, "Be careful. This man's seventy six. He could go at any minute. He lived another twenty years." And the man who said that to me that he could go at any minute died way before Stan Lee. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I, you'll maintain. I think you'll be lived. The, you will redefine the Silver Fox. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words greatly. I, I do believe that, uh, as I've already uh, kind of proven, that I'm able to evolve. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think that I will have my own approach. When I get bummed out about the idea of being middle-aged, elderly, I think, man, you know, like, I'm going to be these ages like in a fashion that nobody's ever done before there you go, like, man. And you get to recreate it right if you look at a thing and you're like well, i don't like how that thing is you've spent your whole life changing that right so why would this be any fucking different you'll get to redefine age and people will be like well that's a way to do it Fuck. right For and sure. then they'll invite the old man to the party he won't be a party foul right, right. he'll be a party plus that. Yeah, I, I love that. And and, and going back to the, what, what I was saying about how I couldn't turn it off. Yeah. When when I did because dude, I was a fucking disaster. It was it was it was gnarly. It you, got, I mean, it got you, really I, you're ugly. very Jason Musian. Yeah. Yes. Very, like, very you, much. you guys are very much of the same cloth. As it well. got it got ugly, especially because I think Jason Muse was a little bit more like isolating. Isolated. He was more behind closed doors, yes. and you'd have to be eventually. Close to he go. got to that point because right. once he got to like the harder stuff once he was to heroin that's not like hey who wants to hang out and do heroin like <laughs> right. you want to talk about depressing people yeah, that really he talked about it on the podcast that yeah. like he went yeah, you took him to the mall and he had to stay with you you guys were walking around or something. I, that was uh, literally si- I, I was a sober living companion before yeah. i knew that you can get paid for that sort of thing <laughs> 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 fucking oh yeah absolutely but yeah it, it's he he was a guy who would eventually be by himself. You seem like a right. party guy that was like in the midst of it all. I, I put together a, a mailing list of uh, 200 of the most influential people who uh, whose contact info I had and barraged them around the clock 24 hours a day with my downward spiral. <laughs> <laughs> Sharing it. That's very kind of you. <laughs> yeah. it was, most it was, people don't get to experience that. It was so fascinating. Give them a taste. I, I was an attention whore at my worst. but <clears throat> And a cautionary tale. For sure, for sure. And, and then getting sober, mm. I kind of identified like, oh, wow, you know, there's this like, you know, like the, the path that I was on wasn't headed anywhere good. So I, I really need to find some separation between the persona of mm. Steve-O and then like whoever I am as a person, you know? Who Now, when you think, you know, like uh, there's a episode of, Batman the animated series when um, he met uh, the Mad Hatter and the Mad Hatter like you know he didn't know most of the episode he was in a dream and at the end he fucking figures it out that he's in a dream and shit and so like Alfred I think it is it, it, you know the coda of the episode is just like how did you figure it out and he goes because in the dream that Mad Hatter was creating for me I was Bruce Wayne and he was like but when I really dream I dream as Batman. So he uh-huh. knew, he's like, this is fake, this is unreal. 
who do you dream as? Do you dream as the persona Ooh. or do you dream as the kid Man, what a, what a great in school? Question. What a cool and question. is there a difference between the two? I, there, there, there's a lot. There, it, it blends a lot. Mm. I would say I dream not as the persona. Mm. I play, I, but what, what, what's interesting is the that persona like, lived the dream. Fuck. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think what, what's interesting is that um, you know, as the, the more like mindful I was to sort of establish an identity separate from the persona, mm. um, and and to really like pay attention to uh, to all of this like sp spiritual practice, the better I got at managing the persona. You know, like the reality was when I couldn't turn it off when mm. I was just fucking nuts all day long. I was not fucking good at being Steve-O. I was not good at managing the business of Steve-O. <laughs> right. I was not good at, at uh, cleverly, strategically mapping out a game plan. Right. And and in sobriety, uh, I, I've taken away a lot of distractions. I've taken away a lot of handicaps. And I've, I've become more and more just laser focused on what I want to accomplish. And I've been really fucking productive and, and oh, yeah, gotten kind of good at it. How long you got now? 14 years of chemical sobriety, five years of sexual sobriety. And now I'm uh, like in, in, in the food deal. My, my latest run with uh, food, is, uh, I'm about 70 days of taking a photo of every single meal before I eat it and sending it to my mentor in the food program. What is that about? What do you mean? I just got so gnarly out of control with sugar. Oh, I don't yeah. even look as much like a guy. I mean, I've lost a lot of weight over the last 70 days. <laughs> you have never occurred to me right. as anything but a thin person. Well, but dude, like, we'll, we'll leave a comedy club at night and he'll get like, you know, two brownies with ice cream on it. And like, why? Why would you do it, that? It, it, it's just compulsive behavior. In the Is whole, it to compound the joy? Like you're coming off the stage and you're like, "Holy shit, I rocked it!" I mean, the adrenaline high. Everyone in this room fucking loves me. What would make this better? Sex, booze, right. drugs, food. Like for me, it's food. It's just like right. I, I like I, I do Hollywood Babylon with Ralph, and we have for like twelve years. We used to do it at. Uh, uh, the improv all the time. Now we're at Flappers and Burbank. With and Ralph. Ralph Garman is a friend of mine. He used to be on K Rock. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, okay. In the morning show, K, uh, the the Kevin and Bean show. So him and I have been doing this podcast called Hollywood Babylon for like twelve years. It's a total like nightclub show. It's real fun and shit. But when the show is done, like Ralph hangs out at the bar and and drinks and and not not like problematically, just right. he enjoys that and hangs out with people and shit like that. I get in the car and I come home and traditionally it was always like, now I'm going to go to my office and I'm going to like eat because yeah. I did good. I, I deserve this. I was very much and still am and will fight forever being a rewards eater. Okay. And it feels like you're a rewards everything. I mean, I think. <laughs> like, I, think, I did it. I'm going right. to throw this on top. But I think uh, in addiction, it's like it's if, you're, you're, if, if you're bummed out, you know, like you soothe, you soothe yourself with, with your reward, you know, whatever the, the comfort seeking behavior is. When is it okay, though? When is it I just think, allowed to be a good thing and not. I think when it. I think what addiction does come down to is like, you know, being addicted to shame. There is no question that sex addiction brings about shame. And that's why a healthier approach to sexuality is so important. And thank God for Blue Chew, because not only is Blue Chew helping my approach to sexuality be healthier, it's helping me approach sexuality with a massive boner. And that's right, you heard me say it. I take my blue chew tablets and that is a declaration of war on Lux's vagina. Yeah, I said it. We have sex after I take my blue chew tablets. Now, if you're in the dark here, what's a blue chew tablet? It's a delicious chewable tablet with the same active ingredients as both Viagra and Cialis, except it costs only a fraction of the price. And for you, the loyal wild ride listener, you can get an entire month's supply of blue chew tablets absolutely for free. You just gotta pay five bucks for shipping. And very quickly and conveniently consult with a medical provider at bluechew.com. Bluechew.com. And 
Use the promo code Stevo. Now, if you're on the fence about this, wondering, but are blue chew tablets like fun? Am I gonna like have a lot of fun with a raging boner having awesome sex? The answer is yes. So jump on this deal, man. Go to bluechew.com, use the promo code Stevo, get an entire month's supply of blue chew tablets absolutely for free. All you gotta pay is five bucks for shipping. And Scott's talking about shame. I am not ashamed of my Blue Chew tablets. I love them, and so will you. So, one more time, bluechew.com, promo code Stebo. Have a great time, and let's get back to this. And I think like that's the kind of bottom line is like, it, that would a core, a core belief about yourself and like feeling shitty and so you're doing things that make you feel shitty and then like you know. there's a so lot it's of that. self-fulfilling there's a lot yeah. of that is that based on Brene Brown someone telling you like hey you're bad or do you just feel bad I think gr- like growing up like thinking you're bad or doing whatever you kind of like were told as a kid and then in your subconscious it kind of sticks around so you seek out those behaviors that like for example this is an extreme version of it but some kid um i knew was born in a dumpster so he thought he was a piece of shit the it's, fuck are so you he, serious he would do he would like sexually do things that like would make him feel like a piece of shit how do you get born in a dumpster a homeless a tough one it's like a homeless lady wow his mom was homeless and she I mean, look, that, that's that's close to the Jesus story, right? Born in a manger, you know, yeah. th- that's not a, a cool place to be born. But the sad thing is the that it haunted him for the rest of his life, something he had no control over. Right. And yeah, but he was like, well, you know, he was pissed off at God, and he's like, well, you know, maybe I am a piece of shit. I was born in a trash can. Oof. And then, like, so, you know, that evolved into, like, just toxic behaviors that you carry out later because it kind of matches up with your core belief what you think about yourself. Right. I think it's also a little bit um, erroneous to try to make logic of addiction too. True. You know, like you, you, you can't like always, it's true. you can't always figure out the origin of it. It's not like a direct A, right. B, C correlation. It's yeah. Not- my, 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 my sponsor always says it doesn't matter how the jackass got into the ditch, just get it out. Yeah. Right, for sure. It doesn't matter what started the fire. Put the fucking fire out, yeah. right? Like you know. y'all have traveled internationally and been around the world. And stuff yeah, like I'm that. an international star, Scott Randolph. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You're all continental. He, he and I have traveled the world, fucking extensively. So here's my question: as somebody who knows what addiction looks like, is familiar with it, do you feel this country is more addictive? Than other countries, I, I, Ooh, my feeling yeah. is America, yeah. the American sensibility, like you know, fucking uh, the pursuit of happiness, right. which is fucking right there, um, in in the founding one of the founding documents of this country. I think it's a very uniquely American ideal to have something that's good and then want to make it better and make it last all the time. Right, that's like, uh, there the was phenomenon a time, of craving that Buddhism talks about. What is it? Explain. When, just whatever your situation is, you you want to improve it. If you're in pain, you want the pain to end. Right. If you feel good, you want the the good feeling to be intensified and to last longer. Yes. So you wait, know? is that so? So the so what do Buddhists say about Buddhists that? Buddhists say that they're the, like, don't do that. No, they, they, you just have to to not let your craving, uh, you know, dictate your life. That that really that happiness is going to come not from uh, improving your, your situation, but rather accepting what is. Mm. You know, sort of uh, being in the present and, and accepting the moment of as it is mm-hmm. and not getting too caught up in improving the, the moment. Is it wrong to want <clears throat> something good to happen as frequently as possible? It, I, I, don't so, think, I don't think so, but w- w- where the, the line I think lives, and I think you're really, really uh, onto something by pointing to America as being problematic. Is that? And I love the country. Don't get sure. me wrong, but it's of course we are. When, but but America's we just want not better all the time, and it's like right. there's always something better than this. Sure. Like you know, think about it. We're marketed right. to on a regular basis. The whole world is, but sure. America is fucking exceptional at Big it, time. making you believe that like. That fucking iPhone's not good enough. You gotta get a new one. Right. So like, seems to be more addiction in America versus like I, I elsewhere. I think there. I think yeah, there is. I, I think so. And I think that America is more caught up 
in the pursuit of pleasure yes. than the pursuit of happiness. You're absolutely right. I think, I think you nailed it right the there. The line is between pleasure and happiness. And now, dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this crazy thing. Um, I don't think I've ever said it on this podcast, but I, I didn't want to have kids. I didn't want to have kids for for a whole bunch of reasons. Right. Um, genetically, like every leaf on my family tree is like suffers from alcoholism, right. addiction, gambling, suicide. You know, on my mom's side of the family, literally every fucking person that we can identify through the family tree is all dead from that shit. Jeez. You know, like I'm the first one to, to break the curse. Right. So passing on the genetics is, is, is problematic. And then there's the, the, this whole dynamic of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, which just stopped being fucking funny. You know, like it, it's, it, it, we're really at a point where it's fucked up. I mean, and I said this to my buddy, of the, I have one friend I've known since we were both nine years old in fourth grade. Mm. His name's Abdullah. And um, he's, his family's from Sudan. He's a devout Muslim. I used to spend so much time at his house and I would p pray to Mecca with Abdullah when we were just kids. And uh, we graduated high school together. He went on to Brown University, got a 4.0. Then he went to Cornell Medical School. Then he became a pediatric surgeon at the Mayo Clinic, has since invented ways of operating on babies that are still in the womb and have not yet been born. And he's the most, like, just unbelievably, like, wonderful person. He's such a gift to the world. And our paths are very different, but we've kept in touch forever. Now, I was talking to Abdullah, probably 10 years ago now. And I was saying, I, I don't want to have kids. He's, he's shocked. And I said, dude, Abdullah, for our parents, um, uh, university diploma meant placement in a career of your choosing. Mm -hmm. For us, not so much. For our kids, it means student debt. It's a nightmare. Like the, 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 the dwindling opportunity in the world is really uh, upsetting to me. And I don't want it on my conscience that I created a human being to, to struggle and suffer. Right. Abdullah looks at me like I'm fucking out of my mind. And he says, in Africa, where with all of the, the famine, the poverty, the disease, do you think people are less happy? Now, my gut response, my initial reaction is, well, fuck yeah, they're less happy. Yeah, yeah. But he, he tells me they are not. And, and, and I, I understand intellectually what Abdullah's point is, which is that you can strip people of, of their health, of their, their, their ability to eat, of their, you know, their shelter, everything. But you cannot strip a human being of their capacity to love another. And that is what true <laughs> happiness is derived from, is loving another. Mm. And so, it's pretty heavy. That is heavy. I went ahead and got the vasectomy. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, all right, Abdullah, I hear you, but to a point. <laughs> but he, but I'm just going to hedge sperm. my bets. <laughs> yeah. He <laughs> saved his sperm just in case. Right. You and did? You, you save a vial or two? I did that. I, I think I would be a reasonably good father, but I just like, uh, I, it, it, there's the genetics, there's the societal concerns, and then there's just the fact that I'm a kid and I'm always going to be a kid. He's the best dad in the world. Jason Mewes, hands down, best father I've ever seen. Jason Mewes was a better father than I was, and I wish he had had a kid before I'd had a kid because I would have seen how you should do it. Um, you know, there was a guy who a lot of people wrote off as a fucking mess and an addict and shit like that. He's been clean and sober now for over 10 years, 12 years. And hands down, the best father I've ever seen. That kid, like, is entertained by a one-man show throughout <laughs> her whole fucking life. A show that most people are like, here's some money, do some funny shit and whatnot. And she gets it for free all the time. You'd be the same kind of fucking father. I, I don't doubt it, uh, I, and, and I appreciate that. I think that, like, I, I have a, a profound <clears throat> respect for the idea of parenthood, mm -hmm. and, and um, I think a lot of people don't. But, it, 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 and, and as fascinating as this conversation is, I feel like it's, it, it is turning into one where it's just me talking about me a lot. And I wanted to, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask you, am I correct that you wrote this song, Too Fat to Fly? 
the song yeah was it did you write a song called no uh, i was, was involved in an incident that i called and then others adopted as too fat to fly when i got thrown off of a southwest air airplane and i was tweeting about it and oh. it fucking went viral i it think was, it was johnny knoxville's cousin roger allen wade the country singer who, who wrote, wrote a song too fat to fly it might have been after I'm not I'm certainly not taking inspired, credit, but it but, could have been inspired by that. So, so so wow, that was now getting kicked off an airplane for being too fat. It, it was. They were never like they never gave me a clear thing. There's somebody who wasn't from Southwest who was like, "Look, I know a little bit about airlines." And when an airplane is fully loaded, and that plane was like fully loaded, and I was absolutely the last one on. I was supposed to be on the next flight, but I was like, "Oh shit, there's a, a seat on this plane. Fuck, I'll get on it." So this person who's involved with airlines is just like, they have weights on planes and like, you were just the last person on. It wasn't like, you're too fucking fat for this plane. <laughs> they were like, yeah. we're over the weight limit. Somebody's got to go. Who's the last person that came on? They're like, that guy, out he goes. How, how much did you weigh at that time? Um, over three bills. I think I weighed my, my like, uh, area code at that point, 323. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But still, I wore it fairly well. I'm not going to say like, I, you know, I could fucking fool you and shit, but... I, I did, it was always spread out fairly well, so much so that people were like, really, you were that fucking heavy? Um, but yeah, that was... Before or after the heart attack? That was way before. Way before? Way before. When was the heart attack? Heart attack was four and a half years ago. In, well, four years ago in February that just passed. What does that feel like? It was, didn't feel like a heart attack. You know, I was raised on fucking 70s television, so I was waiting to Fred Sanford that shit. Like, let's go! You know, you're supposed to be big, clutch your chest, <laughs> fucking yell somebody's name. And really, I just couldn't quite catch my breath. And I was between performances. I was doing a show at uh, the Alex Theater in uh, pa Pasadena, I think, or Glendale, Glendale. And um, we were shooting them for a Showtime special. You know, when you do a show, that you shoot two shows, and then they combine it into, sure. into one. So we shot the first show. And I got backstage, and all of a sudden, I just couldn't quite like catch my breath. And I was like, um, "Can everyone get out of here? I just want to like lay down for a second and shit." Because we had another show in like forty-five minutes. And then I was like sweating profusely and couldn't quite like catch my breath. That was it. Didn't feel anything. Didn't feel chest pain or anything. Uh -huh. And so Jason's wife, Jordan, she runs our company. She was like concerned because she's like, "I never see you like this." So she called an ambulance and at one point she hadn't told me at one point i finally broke down and i was like you know what i feel very fucked up like maybe we should call a doctor she's like it's sunday night all the doctors are closed so i called an ambulance and i was like why the fuck would you do that this is embarrassing i just smoked too much weed that's all the problem is and the first responders came and they these two kids this guy and this girl you know like in production as you're well aware they put together a call sheet uh, for those that don't know, that has all the information you need for the shoot that day, who's on it, who does what, or if, what time you're starting, and so forth. There's also information like, in case of an emergency, this is the hospital that we go to. So there was a hospital on the call sheet that you know was way close to the theater. The kids, the first responders, decided to take me to a further hospital because they were heart specialists. So they made the call. They didn't even tell me I was having a heart attack. They put these fucking leads on me. I was more concerned with how they wanted to, like, uh, take my shirt off. Because they're like, we got to attach the leads to you. At one point, the guy went to just hike my hockey jersey up. I was like, whoa! He yanked it down. I was like, every fucking tit I got is going to fall out. And, shit. and he was like, well, we got to get these leads on you. I was like, well, you can fucking reach under. I'll hold out the hockey jersey. You reach under, use my tits to, as a guidepost, and go ahead. So I was giving them a problem because I was like embarrassed and stuff about my body, all my body shame issues and whatnot. And they, in the midst of all that, they were like, had presence of mind to be like, this motherfucker's having a heart attack. We should bring him to the heart attack hospital. And so they brought me to Adventist. And uh, that made the difference. There was this guy, Mark Ladenheim, Dr. Ladenheim, who uh, I get into the, to the emergency room. And he's like, uh, hi, how you feeling? And I was like, I feel like fine. I just can't catch my breath. Can't like I can breathe, but I can't reach the top and come back down. And he was just like, uh, well, uh, you know, what's your pain level on a scale of zero to 10? And I was like, pain, like negative three. And he's like, oh, that's fucked up. He's like, then you're doing it all wrong. I was like, doing it wrong. He's like, yeah, you're supposed to be in a lot of pain when you have a heart attack. And I was like, am I 
You're saying I'm having a heart attack? You're having a massive heart attack Whoa. right now. Now, I'm not one to point fingers, but I think what Kevin is describing is that he wasn't taking very good care of himself and maybe that's why he had a heart attack. Now, I respectfully submit that if Kevin had been using athletic greens, that maybe that wouldn't happen. I don't know. But I do know that Athletic Greens AG1 is absolutely the most convenient, comprehensive, like just healthy supplement that you can have. Plus, it's totally delicious. It's like this green powder that you, you put in a pint of water first thing in the morning so you get hydrated. And what's in it? Well, 75 different vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods probiotics, adaptogens. I mean, this stuff is magic, man. It fills in all of the gaps in your diet. If you think, man, maybe I'm not eating that healthy, then boom, this is gonna solve that problem. Fills the gaps in your diet. It helps with your gut health. It helps your cognitive abilities because it's just plain good for your brain. I'm telling you, and it's delicious. I use it all the time and You'd be crazy if you didn't. So let's start taking care of ourselves. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Stevo. And what are you going to get? Well, with your first order, you're going to get five convenient, comprehensive travel packs of Athletic Greens AG1 plus an entire year's supply of vitamin D, which boosts the immune system. And, man, it's all good stuff. This just makes you healthy so start taking care of yourself one more time you're going to athleticgreens.com slash stevo and that's all there is to it your first order they're going to load you up with good healthy stuff and you're going to be on that train like me and kevin smith now taking care of ourselves no more heart attacks people get on it athleticgreens.com slash stevo now let's talk about that heart attack He's like, we gotta go very, very fast. So I'm gonna meet you upstairs in the OR. And then they turned me over to a guy who was just like, um, I gotta shave your groin, cause that's how the doctor's gonna get into your heart. So can you take your jorts off or whatever? And so uh, I was like, um, well, I don't wanna do that in front of all these people. You know, fucking ER, everybody there. And I don't give a shit. Like everybody got their own emergency going on, but like we've all been in an ER. I don't care if your mom's dying. Sooner or later, you look around and be like, what the fuck? You know, so sooner or later, somebody's going to look around and be like, is that Silent Bob and his dick out? So I was like, I'm not, I'm not taking off my, my, uh, George. <laughs> Death before dishonor. Truly was. <laughs> Truly was. And the dude's like, are you kidding? We got to go. And I was like, well, what if I just like pull my fucking jorts over to the side and you could just give me a virgin smoothie or whatever. <laughs> And he's like, uh, do you know, realize we're wasting time? I was like, look, man, that dude, that dude who was just here, he told me I had a heart attack. If you make me take my pants off and go dick out in this room, I'm going to have a second heart attack. That's going to be on you. <laughs> so they got me up to the OR, and the doctor's like, why is his pants still on? And the guy was like, he's got body shame issues. I was like, Doc, I got a really small dick. He goes, we don't have time for this. He yanked my shit off like I was in the 70s porn, man, and fucking went to work. So they, in order to, uh, you know, there's many different ways to figure out what's going on in the heart. The doctor suspected it was some sort of blockage or what the medical people call an occlusion. So he uh, threaded a camera up my femoral artery. How to get to it is two ways. They could go in through your wrist or then going through your femoral, which is like in your crotch, in your groin area. So they puncture a hole and fucking go up and they stick a camera up the femoral. And he's like, oh, it's exactly what I thought it was. And I was like, what's that? He's going, uh, you got 100% blockage um, and in your uh, LAD. That's the name of the artery that comes down. Um, so we got to we gotta break it up and, and get a stent in there as soon as Jesus. possible. And he goes, but he's going, you're a comic book guy. You like comic books, right? And I was like, very much. Then he's like, they got a name for this heart attack. It's called the Widowmaker. He goes, wow. doesn't that sound like a bad guy in a comic book? I was like, it does. What's it mean? As if you had to ask. And he's just like, well, in the particular heart attack you're having with the 100% blockage, 80% of the cases, the patient always dies. He's going, but you're going to be in the 20% because I'm good at my job. And he disappeared into my crotch and made magic and shit. So dude saved my fucking life. But while I was on the table... 80-20, you know, I'm no math genius, but I know that those are terrible fucking odds. You know, I figure every time you leave the house, it's 50-50, but 80-20 <laughs> fucking yeah, sucks, worse. man. It's terrible. <laughs> so I started going through the whole, like, you know, well, if my life's going to flash through my eyes, I'm going to start this fucking movie. 
and just tracked my existence up until that point and thought about like everything that worked out and very very little didn't work out in life and like you know i was like well if this is it like you you got a good fucking run like yeah you're only fucking 47 but like packed a lot of fucking crazy living in 47 sure. fucking years so if this is the end like don't be a bitch about it just push back from the table say thank you and fucking go don't be the last dude struggling to stay at the party where it's you got any more fucking beer like just right. go leave the fucking party yeah i love that man. i reached the place i reached a place of like total zen where i was like i'm ready and then motherfucker saved my life so i had to come back to the land of the living and that's fucked up when you're like all right, I'm ready to die. And they're like, well, you're not gonna. And you're like, oh, fuck. It's not like I was suicidal and I wasn't sure. emo and I wasn't like fucking goth. Like, I just want to die, man. But I was like, I get it. Like, my whole life I've been scared of death. And then on that table, maybe it was because he gave me the odds. Maybe it's because I was hopped up on fentanyl. Who fucking knows? But <laughs> yeah. I sat there going like, you know, this, this I remember, you know, I was a big big fan of Neil Gaiman's Sandman book, which is now on Netflix as a show. But back in the day, it was just a comic book. And in the issue about death, his sister Death, who's personified by this like goth girl and shit, she's going around collecting souls all day. You know, people that are dying, they're like, oh my god, I know who you are, and shit. And she takes them wherever they're gonna go. She comes this one guy, older dude, and he's just like, no, no, it's too soon. She's going, yeah, and he's like, well. My whole life I had this and he listed all his fucking like, you know, all the shit he'd been through. He's like, all of that happened to me and what did, what did I get? And the death character says to him, you got what everybody gets. You got a life. So I was sitting there going, I got a life. And fuck that life was great. And it ends. Like it felt, it occurred to me as graduation. For the first time in my life I wasn't afraid of death because I was like, oh, you can't stay in high school forever. Sooner or later you got to fucking go. Mm -hmm. And... I felt That's like I, I was like, yeah, <laughs> truly. <laughs> I get older, they stay the same age. But but it was like a moment of like, oh, it's it's natural, it's right. Like it was always, you know, the enemy to me. You know, when you're a creative person, or you fancy yourself a creative person, or you get paid to do creative things for a living, death is just fucking a slap in the face. It's so insulting. It's like, what? I can't end. I have important shit to do. There's so much here. And I just want to thank you for how fucking fascinating all of that was. Well, it's the van that brings it up. <laughs> and and uh, Scott Randolph here ha like, has watched and continues to watch. Every night. Hundreds, thousands of video testimonies about NDE, near-death experiences. Is that right? Is that your thing? Every, every night before I go to bed, I watch uh, this, this guy on YouTube called Lee Whitting. And he's in Bangor, Maine. I'm trying to like reach out to him because I want to meet up with him. But he's like a hospital <coughs> chaplain that has a podcast, and he interviews people that have died and come back. And you know they're hard to stop for four minutes, nine minutes. Sometimes I think the record's like thirty minutes. My There's... mom. It happened to my mom long before I had a heart attack. My mom has always had like heart problems and shit, and uh, she died on the table. And so she, you know, fucking had a very familiar story about like there was a light. And did she go to the light? She she described it. Well, let's all agree that the light is probably the hospital light, you know. Could, uh, no, because sometimes people are saying, like, you know, they're floating above their body. True. And then all of a sudden there's a light in the corner. True. And then they go to it and then they go to a life review, which I'm fascinated by the life reviews. Oh, yeah. She said she saw, like, dad, because my dad died years ago. She saw my grandma. She saw familiar people. And she was like, she and then she got yanked back and so i was like all right ma you've been here in this best of all possible worlds for many years and you were there for almost a minute which did you like better and fucking she fucked me up by going like there there and i said why and she goes i felt so light she's going every fucking pressure and every every hook in me that I felt in life all the shit that I'm responsible for I was I was done like suddenly I've, I was mm -hmm. like oh my god and she was all that responsibility was was off her I thought that was really beautiful and when I was going through my thing so I don't know if her thing informed my thing 
But like I too, once I was just like, oh shit, I'm probably gonna fucking, this is the last ceiling I'm gonna see in, is in this room. And you know, I was, I should have fucking like terrified me and shit like that. But the, the, the hook of it was that like, oh, this is, this is like, I, you know, I, I was raised Catholic, so there's supposed to be something after this. And over the years, of course, I've let go of that. And I've, you know, I think Scott Mosier, we do a podcast where we did a podcast for years called Smodcast. He had said at one point, he's, you know, he was not raised religious or anything. And Mosier was like, um, you know, I was talking about dying long before I ever almost died. And I was like, what do you fucking think happens after this? Like, you don't believe in heaven? Come on, dude. Like, there's got to be something after this. And he's like, well, you believe in heaven because you were fed that when you were a kid. He's going, but you're way too logical to really believe in that if you step aside and think about it. He's going, I understand that you were raised with it and whatnot, but like, I don't think it's that. And I, he's going, you believe there's a heaven because, you know, you just cannot fucking stand the notion that one day you ain't going to think these thoughts, that the world's not going to share in the glory of fucking you and whatnot. <laughs> and he's like, but I think, I was like, what do you think it is? He's going, I think we're computers. He's going, the computer has a massive amount of information on it. Because that's what I was saying. I was like, how could I just fucking stop and die? Like, I have all this information. And he was just like, a computer is packed with information. It could do amazing fucking things. He's going, and then one day, just hard drive spins down and that's it. Mm. And I was like, shit. That, that was the first time it, it really impacted with me where I was like, oh, you're right. There is no heaven. And I'm not special. None of us are. And what we have in this life is what we have and what we build and that's the fucking adventure and all these fucking people that are fed a line of bullshit about suffering in this world and fucking you know reward in right. the next is like what a what a fucking what a f bunch of hokum that is it's like you got right. no nobody fucking knows what's on the other side and if you really think about it it's probably nothing so this is it well, the joy is here man there ain't no joy after this it's just you just wind down like a computer I, I'm with your mom. You believe I, in the... I, I, yeah, and and um, I, I believe that all religions effectively uh, point to the same, like, universal truth, which mm. is distilled down to the words, we are one. Sure, you know, how about it? We, we are one. And what we are one means, as I understand it, and I think that this is across all scriptures and, and, and stuff I mean to, is that uh, creation um, everything that exists in the universe is an exercise in God experiencing itself because God being one thing cannot uh, have experience because experience is based on relativity one mm. thing relating to another and one thing cannot relate to itself so big bang whatever creation you want to call it is this one thing dividing itself into separate particles which now can relate to one another because there's that that separation but the separation is an illusion it's it's, it's an illusion which allows for you know uh up there's no up if there's no down. There's no hot if there's no cold. Right. This, these are all relative terms. And so I, another fun way to distill it down, somebody said this to me and it really stuck. We are all eyes in the same head. So to go to... It's fucking good. It's a really good one. That is really good. To go to, to Scott, what Scott bring up with the, the life review. Life review is just beyond... Uh, indisputable there's just so much evidence there's so much uh, and life review is like the life, life, life before, your eyes. before your eyes now i've read an article um that's the a scientific piece that was like this is absolutely true yeah you do experience your life before you die and i don't know if it's theoretical or if it's uh, medical but what they came up with was when the body is going through the trauma of shutting down, which is something we're not familiar with because most of our lives, the body is vital and fucking doing the things mm -hmm. that we want it to do. 
when the body shuts down, it is traumatic. Like, because the body's not used to like, oh, this ain't gonna be used no more, we're dying, and it, it shuts down. The brain releases a chemical the that DMT. keeps you calm. My, my, my question with that is, the, the near-death experiences all seem to be the same. Maybe it's DMT releasing from your brain. Mm -hmm. However, the people that do ayahuasca or that do DMT don't have the same experiences as that. And so I'm always wondering, like, if it is the DMT, you never hear somebody come back from an ayahuasca trip saying, I went to the light, I met my spirit guides. Right. It's always another dimension. Well, there's, there's, I, that's what I've been trying to think about. Is it predisposition? Like, uh, you know, uh, everyone sees the same little green men. Like the mechanical elves? Yeah. Is it just something that somebody, they've been telling this fucking go to the light and, hey, you see everybody and your old pets and shit like that? It's interesting. For years, is it just part of us now that, like, well, even if you're not a faithful person or a religious person, that is something to cling to in the darkness. Yeah. Like in a world where nobody fucking knows, at least when you got a faith, you're like, well, I put my faith in Jesus and Jesus says it's going to be this. But let's say you don't have a Jesus and all you got is fucking like, well, oh, that, that, I'll take that. Like maybe how, that's how do enough. You, but how do you explain like um, the, one, one of the girls that died, she said, um, you know, I left my body. Mm -hmm. I went into the other hallways and I saw, she's like, I saw my stepdad getting a Coca-Cola from the vending machine Memory. and he came an hour later. And she's like, but I thought it was interesting because he's always like holier than thou exercise guy. And I, she's like, I made a mental note. Like, that's weird. He's getting a Diet Coke. And then she kept going. And then when she came back, she said maybe like, you know, a couple of days later, she's like, did you get a, a Diet Coke out of the vending machine? And he was like, how did you know that? And it was like a little secret that he had or he was eating a Snickers bar. <laughs> I mean, there's like interesting outer body experiences. Oh, well, yeah, there's definitely proof in that regard. But I think it's more simple than whether there's DMT or, or it's some kind of uh, a physiological thing. Because all of these accounts of life review, and again, life review is your life passing before your eyes, mm -hmm. is it, they all... T uh, take time out of the equation, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. it's 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 a flash, but it's like the the. But you detail, can see the whole story. The, the detail yeah. is time doesn't exist, and then they say they feel everybody's pain that they put exactly. them through. Exactly, that's that's what? the thing. Yeah. That that that's the thing. Is that that's common? Yeah, it, yeah. You, 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 all of them w that do have life reviews say dead. they go through and experience everybody's pain that I dead. put them through. I am joy. I've got the gnarliest goosebumps. Well, that means it's true. The gnarliest goosebumps. It, like what? What? Did, the, the concept of we are all one. We're all eyes in the same head. Right. Like this. This uh, illusion of separation. The life review is an is an experience that that does not. Um, Involve time. The detail is is insane. You actually go through your your whole life and and at the detail that you can't even like describe as a human being. But you go through your whole life and you experience your impact on everything else. So, so every time you that... made every time you made someone happy, you're gonna feel that joy. Every time you made someone. Uh, I did more. I someone. did more pro than than yeah, con, so I'm I, looking I, forward to that. I, but wait, the do you get life review if you live? Everybody, but like if you're yeah. the near death experience, they they've had them. Um, it's like they'll come back and ask if they had a life review, and maybe twenty percent will say no, I didn't. But like the majority are like, yeah. I, I one guy went and he said he his guide took him around. And then he sat him down in a movie theater, and a thing came on, and he watched his movie. Like, there's different ways to do it. Yeah, and, and you can experience how, like, you can experience it, like, as a mosquito that's off in the distance, like, so far away from when you did the most minor thing. Right. And, like, and so it, it, it's just... Uh, I'm it, in. Can you, one, can you induce this? Huh? <laughs> can you induce it? Yeah, they, they. I guess in the East Coast they have. Um, they they shut off your senses and they're trying to recreate. So when they put you in like a an outer sensory body experience, deprivation, something time? there's a. I, I've been trying to look into it and I want to pay for it to do it. You're a fucking yeah. searcher, man. Look yeah. at you. You're a seeker. Good for you. Uh, have you ever Have you ever been to a place that you thought was familiar? Like I, I, 
what I mean by that is like I think in the past life I was Vietnamese. Is that right? I think, and in, in I was also Brazilian because I have like a weird kinship with Vietnamese people. And when I went to Vietnam, I was like, "Oh, this is familiar." Do you have anything like that? And I've always loved Canada for no explicable <laughs> reason, <laughs> so I must have been Canadian, and that makes a lot of fucking sense, <laughs> you know? Because Canadians are good people in general, so they, of course, they'd be reincarnated. You know, they'd yeah. be like, "You're coming back. Yeah. You did it right. You get to do it again." Yeah, maybe in a past life, you're a Canadian. I think so. I, it's got to be. There's no good reason to explain why I like Canada as much as I do. I'll there, buy it. They, and, it's, and it's interesting because both of you guys. I mean, me, and me too, and everybody. Like, I feel so blessed in this life. Me too. Yeah. And I and I and I was asking me somebody about well. that, and they we're said because you were too. probably an, uh, evolved in a in a previous life, and like you, it's like kind of like a karmic. You know, I'm really enjoying this life. And the yeah, only way yeah. I can explain it is that, like, I must have been a really good person in a previous life. I'll, is that? I don't know. what. That's, I mean, look, I'll take that because I like that. But so do shit heels get a better life next time around or does their life get worse? I, I think, like, back? maybe murderers get reincarnated a little bit lower on the life. <clears throat> I, I, mean, I don't know. I think, I think you're looking at it, like, far too simplistically. and um, And I think that... Well, in conversation with God, he asked him how many lives he's had. He's like, 700, or whatever he said. Right, 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 right. I mean... But you could choose to come back to this world if you want when you go to the other side, or you can go... I, it's the soul contract. I mean, do you want to explain this, that? They, 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 there's there's, there's a, a soul contract where, like, you uh, you have, like, a blueprint for what you want to, uh, to experience, learn. what you want to uh, remember, what you want, you know, you choose your parents, you, mm-hmm. you know, you, you go into this, and, and the contract that w- which we uh, enter into, you know, as we, before we incarnate as a body, like the deal is once you incarnate as a body, like you forget the the whole deal. That's like uh, there was a movie years and years and years ago in the late eighties, maybe early nineties, called Angel Heart with Mickey Rourke. Ooh. And he was uh, it was a detective gumshoe yeah, kind of Lisa movie. Lisa Bonet. Lisa Bonet, where they the side story to that allegedly I wasn't there, I wasn't even in the movie business, but allegedly they actually had sex while they were shooting their sex scene. Wow. That's like, if you go on the internet, there's lots of stories about that. In any event, it's a story about a guy, Mickey Rourke's a detective who's hired by, Robert De Niro plays a character named Louis Cipher. Figure that out. Um, He wants him to track down this guy, Johnny Angel, who owes him something. And so Mickey Rourke's looking for this fucking guy the whole movie. And spoilers, in the third act, you find out that he was Johnny Angel and he made a deal with the devil to like become fucking famous and shit like that. And they tried to renege on the deal with the devil and forgot who he was. And so the devil had come to claim his fucking soul and sent him to look for it and shit like that. Wow. Now, when clerks happened to me in 1994, I, you know, I was now I'm like you, I'm an outsider artist. Like there was no, manifest that that was going to happen i lived in new jersey the fucking it's not like i lived in california Wait, it wasn't manifest that you can make a hit movie with twenty seven thousand dollars go figure <laughs> go figure <laughs> i really yeah. tried i was looking for the manifest and there was none. so when we clerks like not when i made it but when it got bought and when it was clear that like oh my god like my dream is actually going to come true i was convinced that i had angel hearted myself that I had made some deal with the devil, and part of the deal was that I would not remember until it was too fucking late and shit. Now, I still got time in this life. I hope I don't find out that's the fucking case. But I like the notion of the soul contract where it's just like, you're gonna, you get to pick and choose the menu, but you ain't gonna remember any of this shit. Right, I'm like, like also a, a big researcher, a big thing, and this, one hang up that I have with the, the, the because in the soul contract in the blueprint for life which we agree to, um, there are predetermined events which are just going to happen, and I can't pre-existing conditions. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> fuck. They, they, Even they, after life, there's pre-existing <laughs> conditions. There's a uh, well, not pre-existing, but predetermined mm. like things that are going to happen, and I just cannot reconcile. Uh, free will with 
predetermination. Yeah, that's an interesting conversation. Like how to, how, that, that's what I want to ask. It's a big Neil thing Donald for lifelong Walsh. Catholics, man. It's just like, yeah. well, I'm responsible, but I'm not. There's a right. grand design, so if right. I sin, that was what God wanted. Right. Now, I don't want to alienate people who are religious. I've got all kinds of uh, people who are religious who I love and respect. With that said, I think that this idea of heaven that we were talking about before is so self-serving. It's like, I'll be like, I'll, I'll be good so that I can get into heaven, yeah. you know? And like, there's the, a reason for your, for your, uh, compassion because you're like, well, right. I, I get something. It's, exactly. It's very, uh, mm -hmm. it's very and it's like, And then the question is then, what is that righteous? Well, is it, is right. it, if good things are coming from an act that is not 100% righteous. Right. Is it... Right. Is it good? Is it going to be righteous? Still? Exactly. If you're like going like, well, I'm doing this. I'm being nice to you. I'm feeding you. I'm clothing you. <laughs> right. But I'm doing it not because like... Yeah, because you want to go to heaven. Because I want to go to heaven. But it's benefiting you. You're sure. fucking getting fed. You're getting clad right. and shit. I think the intention is important. And like... Uh, and what do they say? It's like the, something is its own reward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Virtue, yeah virtue it, is its own reward. Yes, think there you, it is. You're doing it because right. it's the right thing to do, not because you're like, well, somebody's going to pat me right. on the back. Yeah. I, I saw a comment on a YouTube video that I put up, and it said something about like, oh, you're doing you know, doing everything wrong. It's not too... Like, like, like Jesus can say, you really need Jesus to save you. Right. And like, it just kind of got under my skin a little bit, and I actually responded, which I, I rarely ever do. Do. And I wrote back, I said, I said, you know, you're right. Uh, I'm doing everything wrong, but I'm just going to keep doing everything wrong. And I plan on letting Jesus save me later. <laughs> you know, like, uh, that's Jesus, a good thing Je about Jesus. He'll Jesus, come the last minute. <laughs> Jesus is cool like that on your deathbed. The last thing you think is like, let me like, I accept Jesus as my savior and you're good. That yeah. washes away everything. He, I say, and I even said that like between, you know, I'm going to accept Jesus and like, so that he can wipe away all the bad stuff I do between now and then. Right. <laughs> you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, and the idea that that holds water, it just, it just makes me so mad. And that's why I love the life review thing, because it's, it's, it's not a, the, the life review is you're not being punished hmm. for, for the bad things you did when you experienced the, the harm that you caused others. You're not being rewarded for the joy that you brought people. You're just experiencing it as it was it's not a punishment it's not a reward it is just simply the immutable laws of of the universe the law of cause and effect you you experience the the, the you reap what you sowed you know like it's just not good or bad it's just that which is mm -hmm. and that's very very like big in the cosmos you know like it's not yeah. we 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 assign good and bad but in reality there is no good and bad there's just simply the law of cause and effect I um if somebody had told me the best conversation you're gonna have about the afterlife is gonna be with Steve O one day. <laughs> yeah. I would have been like, I'm sorry? What is are we in heaven when this happens? Are we in the afterlife? He's playing a harp in the clouds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Did I, I die during a jackass thing? Am I on jackass? How does this all happen? Well it's interesting because most religious people that die and come back, they come back and they ask them if they're religious, they're like, Oh god no. I would never they leave it behind. They leave it behind. And, like, uh, I did that once. <laughs> I did that, and they're like, I realized there's no judgmental God. There's just a love, you know? Mm, I like that. They're, they're, More they're, of that, less of everything else, man. Yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of people in this world who have a brand of Jesus I wasn't raised with. Right, right. You know, I may not subscribe anymore, but, like, shit I was fed as a child was was beautiful and righteous and, and, and really fucking fueled me for the rest of my life. I don't do things because of God and heaven anymore. I was doing because this is the right thing to do. And that right. a lot of that came from that forced morality of like, you know, hey man, there's right and there's wrong and blah, blah, blah. But more of it came from not so much the church and religion, but comic books. That was where I, I got a that. moral barometer from where it's just like, well, fucking do the right thing. Like, yes, you could get, you get ahead with the bad thing, but ultimately these fuckers always lose and right. fucking good always ultimately triumphs it is a long what is it the, the moral arc of the universe is long and bends toward justice yeah do unto others 
that's ex literally how I was raised. I was raised with the, the golden rule and shit. Like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And also my parents were very, like, patriotic, but not in that, like, America, fuck yeah <laughs> way. They just really believed in, like, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness was key for these fuckers. Right. You know, they, my old man worked, like, at the post office at night. We were so glad he never went postal and fucking killed yeah. anybody. And my mother, like, didn't work, but, we, you know, we struggled. We were, like, a poor family and shit like that. But there was, there was no, like, sense of, like, well, we'll suffer now because Jesus will take care of us later. No, it was right. just be good to people. And not because it's going to get you anything. It's just because that's what you want. It's very right. simple in life. Like, just proceed with others as you would have them fucking proceed with you. Comment in the YouTube section as you would want somebody to comment to oh, you. Exactly. <laughs> right. and that, even that is Jesus. fucking like, you lost. fat motherfucker. Oh, like, bro, how would you like it if somebody I, said that to you? I think that, that, that <laughs> what, what we can arrive at, though, is that... It's not about, like, what, I like when we're, we're computers, but then the drive goes down. Like, here's the thing about that computer. Here's the thing about that, that computer when the drive shuts down. Mm -hmm. Fucking information still on that computer. And it's so just that, that one machine. It's done. So yeah. where does that information go, you think? Well, he, I, I have this zany theory that I think I, I really love it we had a, considering I for was raised in the Catholic Church like <laughs> no theory yeah. is, is uh, off limits or zany my favorite podcast that we ever did on this in, in this van was on zoom with a, a comedian named Duncan Trussell yeah, who's, right. who's uh, and, and and we had this this really fun conversation about my zany theory where um, the body right which uh, I, th I said, I think that, and I really do believe this, I think that people are wrong in assuming that the brain is a transmitter of consciousness. That, that We have this idea that the brain is creating the consciousness, the thought, and the mind. Where, where in, in that view, when the body dies when then then the, the the consciousness dies with it because of course the brain is creating the consciousness right. i said picture it as a radio right now like a picture so it's a tra pic we're receiving we're, transmission we're a receiver. like that the consciousness is the signal and our body is just simply the receiver you know, and so you could take a sledgehammer, you can smash a radio to, to, to smithereens, and yeah, you've you've effectively destroyed that radio, but you've not done anything to the signal. And so the signal is I would like to subscribe to your religion, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think these thoughts are and, right and, in line with mine own. And and Duncan Trussell he he really found that a bit delicious. He said, Man, you know, there's some people walking around there they think they're the fucking Beatles. Yeah. They're just a fucking <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. That's funny. <laughs> they just a radio playing the Beatles, you know? And, and so So then who are we transmitting? I mean, I mean that now. Love. Yeah. And, that, and and what we shape it into personality and to add all the things that make it uniquely ours. So love is universal. Yeah. And when we're transmitting it or we're here to spread love, joy, whatever the fuck, we have to shape it through we how we can deliver it. We, we don't, don't deliver to. it the way that other everyone else I think else everybody does. has a different soul. Yeah. Yeah. We, I we, think it's a soul thing. And some people believe in soul, some people don't, but I think I everybody's, I everybody's unique. Yeah, we, we don't have to do anything. It comes back to, to the idea that there is no good, there is no bad, there's just... Is. They, they, there just is and this experience is exactly that we are an exercise in God experiencing itself because without creation God can have no experience like God doesn't want to be lonely God doesn't want to be lonely so there's our, also something about how like you know I'm not uh, that educated but like cell division is the beginning of life right yeah and right. so in this theory where right. God divides, divides it, it mirrors yeah, the very like creation of life itself. That's that's good. I, I, I like that too. That's what I'm telling you, you can fucking build a faith on this shit. And, you can make and, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Nobody's got the answer, man. So you just give them something that sounds good. They're like, that, fuck yeah. That cell division comment gave me goosebumps too, because it, like, there's a way of viewing it that like we we are individually cells in the ultimate organism of 
god of the universe. Yes, you know? and the, like, and the cell, do you think the cell, well, I mean, the, if the cell has any sort of consciousness, do you think a single cell in the body is like the, yeah, we're the fucking Beatles. Do you think that cell thinks it's running all of this? I, I, and <laughs> is that cell is that cell wrong? Is it truly running all this in collection with everything else? Everybody doing I mean, their little bit. I think that, that to the extent that we are all one, there is every, everything is divine. So yeah, the cell's the Beatles because there's divinity in fucking everything. And when you take this view, we're all eyes in the same head. We're all just a piece of the same fucking divine loving God. Like just this one, we're all just in like a, a component in the experience of this beautiful universe. Then you've, you've, you've obliterated the idea of hate, of, of uh, anything negative, because it's like, dude, you're, you're every bit as much God as I am. Right, right, right. You know, like how, how can you be demeaning or hateful to... to why would you want to be? Yeah, why would you want to be? And then with the life review, we're, like that's when the illusion goes away and you realize, oh shit, like it was just all one fucking thing. And now, now I'm experiencing it as one thing. That's you go through the review and experience every influence that you had. And that's why I thought I was in a good spot when I was doing the 12-step program was because um, when you do the ninth step and make things right, I was like, fuck man. Like I get to do that now consciously. Right. You know, like I, and I went back and made a lot of things right as if like, because I've done it a couple of times. And then the first time I didn't know about life reviews, the second time I did, hmm. but the second time I did, um, you know, you, you, you go through and you're like, it just helps you kind of figure out, you know, like, fuck, I really made that person feel like shit. Right. You know, right. I, I got to make that right immediately. Right. There was a, uh... Uh, a fucking wall hanging a decoration that's been in our house since we moved in we moved in like since you bought it 20 from ben years affleck ago. this was ben <laughs> affleck's we're parked, we're parked in front of ben affleck's old house uh, it would have creeped him out no end but yeah i bought affleck's house years ago and we still even though he lived in it for like a year and i've lived in it for 20 we still call it ben's house <laughs> like oh i live in ben's house um in uh in ben's house uh, my wife has uh, like decorated over the years. Uh, it's really beautiful. It's like all the walls. It's not like you know, fucking Clerks and Jay and Silent Bob. It's all about our family and history and stuff like that. But um, there was this wall hanging. You know, she was into yoga for a while, and there was this wall hanging that like hung in our house forever. And I would see it all the time. It was by a a place where I come out the door, so it's like you can't avoid this see it every day and so you know i've seen it and i didn't cognize it one day i was standing there waiting for something and i was reading it and it finally sunk in it's very very simple and it says may you realize your divinity in this lifetime hmm. and it kind of crystallized in that moment where i was like oh yes and and i have and that doesn't mean like you think you're a god it means right. like what you just said like we are all many eyes in the same head. We're all, you know, cells in one giant fucking organism and stuff. And realizing that you come from the divine. And I'm not saying like God and Jesus or whatever sure. the fuck, but something divine. I mean, step back and call the world what you will, but you have to admire the intricacy. You know, it's, it is divine. Life right. is divine. I mean, put, put it this way when the cell in your our cells you know uh, regenerate die die like you know that the, the, think of it that way when we die is there nothing left is there nothing left for the the cell in your body that dies and is you know what in, in one sense yeah that cell yeah but what is that cell it's the bigger well, thing. if we take it right back to the beginning it's God trying to understand, right. trying to relate. Not even understand, experience. Experience, that's it. There's no such thing as learning. There's only remembering. And uh, Say it again? There's, no, there's, no, there's nothing to learn. There's there's nothing to learn. There's remembering. That's a big uh, I buy thing. that. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all of that. That was a brain burner for a second. I was like, well, what? <laughs> You're right. Yeah, the only <laughs> thing that you have to do, and this, people are always looking for the answer to life, and I'm not saying I know it. I'm just saying what, you know, the sum of the substance of conversations with God is, is like, 
your whole role is just to experience life in all yeah, facets of it. That's a gift. Ram Das will say that. Alan Watts will say I mean, all these people that come and just say, enjoy. And, and, yeah. and, and my, my, I, I like that. I think mo- our, Scott and I's view of the universe is, is, uh, is really based on this book that we both just, that, that resonated so much with both of us, which is Conversations with God. Who wrote? Uh, Neil Donald Walsh. It started as a trilogy. There's been many books since then. And uh, Scott and I flew to Chicago for no reason whatsoever but to attend a conference <laughs> where Neil Donald Walsh was a speaker. Wow. We were like the only Fan dudes. Boys. Yeah. yeah. We, we were just like, dude. We, we were like, <laughs> oh, dude. And, and it just so happened that, um, that there was a UFC pay-per-view event <laughs> in Chicago that night. Right. And, and we, we loved the UFC, too. Right. So I got to ask Neil Donald Walsh like uh, what he thought about. I said um, in in your book, uh, the, the the third book in the trilogy, you talk a lot about uh, highly evolved beings mm-hmm. and 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 the idea, the notion of sport uh, being based on the idea that one. Uh, team or participant uh, wins and the other loses that like that that would kind of go against any highly evolved uh, you know concept that that you would one would benefit at the expense of another right. so does that mean I can't enjoy sports and he said oh dude you're overthinking it man I mean come on dude like sports sports is great you know I said okay well now let me take it one more sports is okay but we're going from here to go watch people try to harm themselves as much as humanly possible in a locked cage at a <laughs> u- ultimate fighting event. Right. Is that wrong? <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, I wouldn't personally choose to do that. That's not, doesn't sound like my thing, but I got to believe that there's some, some art to it, some skill to it. Some, you know, he says, he says, I say, go and have a great time. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Fuck man. Permissive, but yeah. not permissive in the way of like, do bad things just right. like you know go easy on yourself yeah go easy like yeah you have to you're in the distraction business thank you you need to be distracted <laughs> from you. time to time as well <laughs> the distractor you. needs to be yeah. distracted. So the chef has to eat too and what does the chef eat before the chef prepares food for others dude that that's such a beautiful thing to end on because we i wanted to that you you said it and and i formally uh, identify as this, like uh, I, you know, I do, I do all this dumb stuff. I hurt myself. I do think, you know. Yeah, was, was, when you were going like, these fuckers lock themselves in a cage and they're trying right. to hurt themselves. It's like, <laughs> not that far removed <laughs> from what you've done as well. Right, right. But uh, you know, you could say I like I, 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 I break bones. I shove things up my butt. Like I'm the lowest brow form of entertainer that you could possibly imagine and and one one might jump to the conclusion that that makes me a, a kind of a low level like you know and and i just don't see it that way i mm. i think like my, my view on it I, I identify first as an attention whore and then I, I i i really say like that's the reality but i consider the the in this experience like what you described as your mom thinking all mm. of the hooks that were in all of the weight mm. all of the stress everything that attended she just with felt the, lighter suddenly right. she's like i'm free i'm off mm. the hook from all that shit. Right. and not that she wasn't saying my life is bad it's terrible right. but even the minor pressures of like sure. oh, i gotta take the garbage out Lot of all weight. that shit yeah. was gone she's like i don't have to do a fucking thing. <laughs> she felt right. lighter in there. Right, and so there are, there is all of that attendant weight and stress and and hooks in the human experience. And I think that that most people, I, th- I think you could probably say the majority of people don't genuinely enjoy their job. I agree. You know, like they they 100%. don't they don't enjoy. My their job. My father didn't. That's why I do what I do. I, I right. raised by a man who every night he worked at the post office, did the night shift. And f- fucking was undone every right. night, like desperate not to go, For like sure. a man who's being walked to the fucking death, yeah, you know, to the, the fucking gallows or something. Like he was just like, oh god, I can't. Right. And, and so it, over a lifetime, you're like, oh, I don't want a job. Right. Look what it does. I'll take a shot doing some weird shit. Yeah, most people don't enjoy their fucking job. A lot of people aren't happy in their marriages. Some people are physically like uh you know suffering yeah. you know like like there's a lot of, like a lot of people 
don't fucking enjoy their day. And, and my goal as an attention whore is to, is to create some compelling fucking thing to witness that serves as a distraction from that. And, and, and I actually formally gave myself the title of a distraction therapist. That's absolutely right. It's, it's a beautiful way of putting what know, we do for a living. Right. It, and now, now I don't, I'm not going to be so arrogant as to say that like I can fix any, I'm not fixing any problems. Mm -hmm. I, I, I respect your problems enough to know that they're not going away. Yeah. I'm not going to fucking improve your situation. I'm just going to, to in the moment, in the, if I'm doing my job right, I've entertained you enough that I have made your problems disappear temporarily because you're not thinking about them. And that's a big fucking noble thing. Put it this way. Who's the most important person in a kingdom? The king. No, the fool. Because if the fool don't fucking make the king laugh, the king's a real bitch and everybody gets dead. <laughs> <laughs> so at the for end sure. of the day, the distraction, that's what makes life liv livable for a lot of fucking jester, people and stuff. I'm going to tell you a story before we get out of here that it just as we were sitting there going like, oh my God, I, I owe you. So uh, I got this new Clerks movie coming out. Yeah, there we uh, go. We're touring it. Uh, you can come see it with me or you can see it. Uh, it opens August. September 13th. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's Clerks 3 dot movie is where you can find tickets and information in any event i tell you that just to remind folks that i from time to time i make movies um that means i've always made movies that tend toward the what's the term for your universe of movies? view -esque universe what is the it? ones that are connected the view -esque universe my production company was called view askew so like back in 94 we were like this is the view -esque universe so i have gone up in front of the mpaa a few times. The MPAA motion is the Picture Motion Picture Association, Association of America. America, and they're the folks who are responsible for rating a movie. Yep. So, you know, PG, R, fucking NC-17G, that's their fucking job. Um, traditionally, I've made movies that are very frank and colorful with the language and shit like that and obsessed with irreverent. sex. Irreverent. Very irreverent, as they say. So, there have been R's pretty much across the board, but periodically... I've been handed an NC-17. First time was on Clerks. Clerks is a movie with no nudity and no violence whatsoever. Just for all that conversation, the MPA was like, this is not suitable for children under 17. Would, would you not uh, revise it and then resubmit it until you got it down That's to the That's a process. R? Well, you can do that, and that's part of the story. So uh, I have gone in front of the MPA uh, four times to argue a rating down, because you have a, two choices. Right. You could do the cuts that they're suggesting, um, to get to the rating that you want or you can arbitrate it and right. when you arbitrate it you go into like what feels like a court setting um, you uh, they show the movie to uh, an audience made up or jury if you will of members of NATO which you're like holy shit but it just means the National Association of Theater Owners so <laughs> these are the Putin? people yes a, a <laughs> you're like what the fuck a um, theater what theater owners so owners. people okay, who got basically got it, got it, got if you own a movie theater yeah, you're the yeah. last line of defense and so they're the best judge because they're the people who have to deal with the people who are like I paid five dollars to watch this movie and these people are cursing their fucking fool heads off and blah 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 they deal with the public so they have a better idea of what the public they can sit also with. make more money if more people are allowed in yes absolutely <laughs> so so you basically show the movie to the to the nato crowd is like six people and then you do a, a kangaroo court of sorts the mpaa person gets up to say this is why we think this movie is, is this rating and you know we stand by it and then you're allowed to get up as the filmmaker and say why you don't think that's the case so i've done that on clerks i did it on jersey girl i did it on zach and miri and each time i zach and miri, miri make a porno yeah i watched that I'm like, well you're, you have I'd... something to do with it and i'll tell you how that is <laughs> so so those three movies alone like i went to, in front of the mpaa and flipped it each time. Jay and Silent Bob strike back. We didn't go to arbitration, but like uh, that too, I argued at one point. I was like, we could totally keep this. So I had a good record for beating the MPAA. Um, the third time I went for Zach and Miri, like uh, at, at one point that we'd made a movie called Yoga Hosers, which was a kid movie, kids movie, and they gave it an R. And I said, well, I'm gonna. I'm going to arbitrate and instantly they're like, we're just going to flip it. You're fine. You're PG 13. We don't want to go through this with you again. 
Um, so on the third one, which was Zach and Miri, they gave us an NC-17 for a sequence in the movie where Jeff Anderson is playing Deacon, the cameraman, and he's shooting uh, Jason Mewes, uh, who's playing Lester, um, fucking uh, Stacy, um, who is played by Katie Morgan. And he's uh, in the scene, he's fucking her in the ass. And, and Jeff Anderson is below with a camera shooting the whole thing. This is predicated on a story I once heard that really happened to Barry Sonnenfeld. Barry Sonnenfeld, the director of Adam's Family, many things. He was a DP for years. Uh, a DP is director of photography. Uh, he was shooting somebody uh, having anal sex for a porn early in his career. And the person pulled out and he was fucking sprayed with shit. And so he was like, I'll never do a porn again. So somebody told me that on a commercial set. I was like, I'm fucking totally using that story. So in our scene, uh, Jeff's character is shooting this anal scene. And then something happens and Jay turns very shocked and, and pops out. You don't see that part, but you hear it. But what you see is a visual of Jeff Anderson getting fucking sprayed with shit. Speckled. Yes. Oh, beyond speckled. This <laughs> okay. is just a fucking pudding got dumped on his face. Shot is two seconds and change. Two seconds and maybe 14 fucking frames of the shit on the face. So naturally the MPA was just like, never. In a million years, you can't fucking do this. So... I got to arbitrate. And when I went up to arbitrate, so ladies and gentlemen, we all agree that the fake fecal matter that wound up on my actor's face is a product of movie magic. That's not shit. That's, we mix up. It's oatmeal and some fucking coloring and shit like that. So if we all agree that, then we know that like we're in the unreality business. I was like, there was a motion picture that just came out fairly recently. It was called <laughs> Jackass, the motion picture. And in Jackass, they wear a fart helmet, where at one point somebody farts so fucking hard that fecal matter sprays into a living human being's fucking face. And this is not fiction. This literally happened. Ladies and gentlemen, that movie is rated R. If that's real and you let it go, how can you fucking stop fake poop? And they wow. flipped it. You're so like, because of you guys. You're lucky I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> because nothing made it into that mask. That's just the power of my imagination. Is that really the, the, it? The idea that something was gross was just an always. Your performance was so strong <laughs> that it made the MPA go like, wow. well, right is right. Wow, that's really fantastic. I was that's thinking cool. as we were talking, I was like, oh my God, I forgot. Like, that's a big part of my mythology It's just like. Me standing there, go. It was. It was my. Uh, That's a great case you built. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I submit the fart helmet. <laughs> that fart it was a real law and order so, for a third act moment. It's so great, and and what's even greater is uh, the artistic integrity in not just cutting the scene. You're like, no, man, my art. Well, I'm, again, I had a justification me. where I'm like. Their, their movie is essentially a documentary. Like, they're, right, they're, yeah. you guys are doing real fucking right. things. And maybe there's a heightened air of like, hey, we know there are cameras here, but it's real. I'm right. like, if they can really do that, why can't we fake do it? Now I'm really glad to know that there was no fucking shit <laughs> well, in there. It's, it's, it, uh, I would have weakened my argument. They would have been like, there is no shit in that film, Mr. Smith. I would have been like, oh, I see. Your, your, your argument would have been really, really good um, if you had uh, our third jackass movie with me getting launched up in the porta potty. I was covered in shit. <laughs> really? really? <laughs> oh, yeah. What? But now, in dodgy. that moment, do you oh, have shit. the presence of mind to keep your mouth closed or no? I didn't. No. Oh, my God. Oh, my, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I mean, there's commitment to your art form, and then there's shit in the mouth, Steve. Jesus. I know. Yeah, it was dog shit because OSHA won't let you get covered in human shit. They found well, yeah, a that's a fucking, that's, yeah. that's good Good to know. It's an inside they, they fucking They found tip. a company, I don't know if the company still exists, but a company in Los Angeles County somewhere that will sell you as much dog shit as you care to purchase. And the name of the company was, or is, I don't know. We do do do. That's genius. <laughs> oh my god, that's fantastic. Yeah, I have no idea what their clientele is. <laughs> Beyond I, you I, guys. <laughs> How much do you pay for shit? Like a hundred dollars a pound? Like what's I, the I, I, rate I don't for... know. I don't know. But on this on the fourth movie, they, I won't they, go uh... above five thousand bucks. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> uh, on the fourth movie, they uh, they was it. 13 gallons, 15 gallons of pig semen. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of happy pigs. I, yeah. What do that, you need pig semen for so other than... Make pigs. It's just oh, like, I mean, other than us? It, it, was, it wasn't a company that did pig semen. It was it, a... They, 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 
they didn't do they don't do we do <laughs> we do yeah come uh, so right. osha in that instance osha's like all oh, the pig come you want yeah for sure um they, it wasn't they, they they found a pig farm with the guys willing and and dude, they interviewed the guys about how much they're spending all their days just jacking off pigs for you guys for us yeah and it wasn't something that they normally did <laughs> and, 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 to say the least yeah, yeah. and, and, and <laughs> pigs just happen to uh have the most volume per load is that right they're just yeah. like arcing ropes of jism and shit. not even arcing ropes like pints <laughs> <laughs> wow could you yeah. imagine those pigs who is a bigger fan of jackass than those pigs right <laughs> yeah, they got to get jacked off for weeks for oh my guys. god yeah. they're like are you guys making another movie soon <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so uh so you're doing the tour with clerks three it's, yeah uh, i we did it with reboot uh james right, Bob reboot that. and stuff we've done it with a few of the flicks i you know i try to so does that exist mean... in the business still in a business that doesn't care about me or want me and shit like that and so i, I find the nooks and crannies to be able to kind of do what i does Still that do. mean that the film only uh, plays where you physically are for the first for the, run? For the tour, generally speaking, yes. But we also have, for people who are like, I can't fucking be in Detroit to see your movie on one night. or fucking, right. And I don't want to pay $100 to do so or whatever the fuck. Um, we also put it out through Fathom Events, which just goes into normal ass movie theaters. Right. So it was supposed to be like screenings on September 13th and 15th, but everyone bought so many advanced tickets that Fathom was like, we're going to extend it for like a week. So we're going to get a Friday and a Saturday, which is kind of cool. So people could see it that way, just at a normal ass theater, or they can go to like a theater theater and watch it with me, and then we Q&A afterwards. I, I watched the trailer and uh, I, I I loved the the uh, C three PO and R two D two joke. That shit. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's very the whole movie's very informed by that heart attack. I I gave my heart attack to one of my characters and. You know, my unlike my unlike me, my characters like still work at that store that I used to work at. Wow. Um, but my life changed because I was like, I'm gonna make a movie about working in this store, and so that's what Clerks Three is. Randall right. survives a heart attack. He's like, fucking, I've watched movies my whole life, never once thought about doing this. Fucking, I'm gonna make a movie, and he makes a movie about working in the convenience store. So essentially, they make Clerks, right. the movie that we all know. So it's fun because it allows you to get meta as fuck. Sure. The snake doesn't just eat its tail; it jerks itself off into its <laughs> mouth like a pig for a fucking jackass. Show. Um, but it's uh, it's it's good. It's funny. And it's fucking beautiful. Like in the conversations we've just had about life and uh, what happens after, um, this is a, a movie I think you'll both dig cool, for that man. very reason. Based on the conversation we had before, I got in this van, I'd be like, maybe they'll see it one day. After I leave this van, I'm like, oh, you'll, you'll dig it. It's about the very things we've been talking about. Dude, I cool. love it, man. I love yeah. it. I love it. And, and wow, this is, uh, we might have set a record for the longest we've gone on a podcast. Is, is that right? I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the sound of my own voice. So that, that was it inevitable. It, 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 it's, it's been, uh, dude. It, well, it's I have been, an hour and 34 on here. Yeah. I I, I, Look at that. 90 minutes, man. They could have watched Clerks how, 3. How long's your movie? It's, it's, like, it's 92. We're longer than Clark's <laughs> 3. I it's love so it. so fucking funny, too, because DK was uh, asking us, hey, what do you think about doing four sponsors on an episode? And I'm like, no, dude. That, that's going to start to bum out the audience. I'm not willing to do that. But on an hour and a half. Yeah, now you're stretched. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now there's some real estate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, man. Thank you so much, Kevin. Appreciate dude. it, man. Thanks for having yeah, us. It's been for great. for sure. <laughs> Hell yeah. Dude, that was awesome. This is good shit, kids. My God. And again, you, I didn't have to walk very far. I walked out of my house. You want to do it again tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, let's do it again. Yeah, dude. That genuinely was my new all-time favorite episode. I really think. Um, fuck, I loved that. And, uh, you know, I love you for sticking around. And as we approach, what is it? August 24th. It's uh, one month and three days until my book comes out. A hard kick in the nuts. What I've learned from a lifetime of terrible decisions. I'm really excited for this book release. And uh, if you haven't already pre-ordered the book, please do because that's the only way to get a signed copy of the hardcover version when it first comes out. That was my little thing. I was like, man, like I'm going to sign the pre-order ones. So please pre-order it because it's going to help the book so much if you do. And if you read my first book, you know that that book kicked ass. And this one's every bit as crazy. So yeah, dude, um, let's 
let's pre-order that book. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much, man. Wow, this was a killer fucking episode too, huh? Yeah, dude.